morning. Everybody hear me? Good morning. Hey, if you would, stand with us. And, you know, as everybody continues to talk, we don't want to stop that. Friendly church is important. So we're not going to tell you to stop doing that. So as we play and sing, if you just want to turn around and say good morning to somebody, shake somebody's hand, it's work out really well. All right.
Y'all sound great this morning, I gotta say. Y'all may be seated, thank you. Before we go on, I think it's important to go to the Lord in prayer this morning. There's been a lot going on in our world this week, especially locally. A lot of people that are close to a lot of us have lost a lot. And so as a church, I think it's so important for us to come together and remember all those that have went through a lot more than, than maybe we've had to go through this week. Our dear and gracious Heavenly Father, we appreciate this another day that you've given us, Lord. We're thankful for the opportunity to be here. God, we just ask you to be with each prayer request that's been made here. Be with all the people that's been in the storm and without their homes and their family. Lord, we just pray for you to be with our nation and be with our leaders because we need that so bad right now. God, just help us and guide us and keep us safe. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Stand with us once again.
trust God and believe in God and have faith in what God's plan was for them, he picked them because he knew that they did have faith in God. And no matter what, they knew God's plan for him, they would obey, right? Yeah. So you're going to have a picture to color, and Miss Helen has brought y'all a little treat. Can everybody turn around and tell Miss Helen thank you? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, 
And y'all can get your packet when you got your M&Ms. Mm -hmm. If you got your Bibles, please turn to the book of Matthew and chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. And this morning, uh, when Dad called me to and asked me to preach as they would be traveling, I know last week, we weren't here last week, but I think he touched a little bit on Mary and the story and what she went through around the, the Christmas narrative. And so... This morning, I want to I stay on that same theme, but I want to look at Joseph's side of the story, which is kind of unique. You know, we don't really talk a whole lot about Joseph, and he's a quiet man. There's nothing in the Bible that he has ever said. He, he never said any words, so, uh, but he's a very faithful man, and that's what I want to go through this morning. So, if you're in the book of Matthew chapter 1, say amen. amen, and we'll be picking up at verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make a, her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophets, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for allowing us to gather together as your church, as your people. Lord, we're blessed in so many ways, and I pray this morning that, that your word would just open our minds, open our eyes, and open our hearts, and that you would reveal what you want to say to us this morning, Lord. May we leave any guard that we have at the door. May we leave anything that's, that's strained us this week that would get in our way of what you have to say to us, Lord. Please have your way in this service. Please have your way in the music. Please have your way in everything we do, and have your way in this sermon. In your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 So before we take right off, I think it's important to note, and most everybody in here is aware, that Mary and Joseph are young. Mary is a young teenager. Joseph is probably between the ages of 18 and 22. And so there's two young people who's come together just trying to figure things out, trying to figure life out, trying to get things planned out, plan, you know, trying to get things organized. Here you are, a young couple coming together, trying to prepare for life. And then God puts this huge responsibility on you, this young couple. And think about this. Think about the shoes that they had to fill and the fact that God trusted them with the Messiah, his only begotten son. That's huge shoes to fill. That's a great responsibility for two young people who's just trying to start off. And I think about Whitney and I when we first got married. Man, we were just trying to figure out how to get a new smart TV. And they're, they're trying to figure out how to raise the Son of God, you know. And the Bible says that they're betrothed. If, you're, if your Bible says engaged, it's not giving you the true accurate meaning of the word. To be engaged means there's nothing legally binding you two together. You want to get married. You have plans to get married. You might even have a date set. But you're not legally married yet. It can be broken off at any time. You're not legally bound. You're not even biblically bound. You're engaged to get married. But in the Hebrew culture, to be betrothed or espoused, as the King James says it, is an actual uh, ceremony that takes place. The two of you are legally bound after you're betrothed to be married. That means you're not married yet, but you're betrothed to be married, which means you are unionized just as marriage. You are legally bound. That's why in verse 18 we see that uh, it's referred to as being betrothed, but in verse 19 it says that Joseph is Mary's husband. So they are legally bound being betrothed together. And uh, as you remember last week, I'm sure as Dad talked, I want to tell you just a, a story a little bit before we jump right into our text. As Dad talked last week about Mary, and she received this word from Gabriel the angel about what God was going to do in her life and how God was going to use her, how she was going to be the mother of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What a responsibility. But he also gave her word that her cousin Elizabeth, who is elderly, has also got a miracle baby inside of her. 
And so Mary gets excited. She gets, you know, so excited that she takes off to go visit her cousin Elizabeth. And Mary lives in Nazareth. Elizabeth lives in Judah. About 90 miles separate the two. For us, that's what, a drive to Louisville? No big deal. An hour and a half if traffic's not too bad. But for Mary, it's a three-day journey through a desert terrain, up and down hills and mountains, valleys. She might have had a donkey, but that's really not going to speed up the trip too much. And now on top of that, she's already become pregnant. So you can imagine, here she is in the desert terrain trying to travel three days, mountains and valleys, and all this other stuff, and she's dealing with morning sickness. It's a huge deal. But she goes and she gets there, and Luke gives us the, the beautiful picture of when John the Baptist, who is in Elizabeth's womb, hears Mary's voice, and remember, he leaps with joy when he hears Mary, and he gets excited. You know, the baby rolls in mama's womb. And I tell you that story, and I say all this because Mary don't just travel three days. You don't just travel three days to go and then turn around and come back. Bible scholars and theologians will say that she was there upwards of three months. I mean, that was customary. So the reason that's important, why is that important? Because when she comes back to Nazareth, stay with me, I won't be boring all, all, all service, I promise. When she comes back to Nazareth, three months later, she comes back betrothed to the man she's loved, never had physical relations with Joseph. She comes back with a baby bump. Now put yourself in Joseph's shoes here. How do you think Joseph is handling all this? How do you think he's, he's dealing with all this? This is a big deal. And even if she does tell the truth, you're telling me. Now, come on, Mary. I know you're a good girl. You're sweet. But you're telling me you come back after a three-month stay in Judah. In Joseph's mind, he's done, she's done shacked up with some guy in Judah, gotten pregnant and come back. And even if she does tell the truth, you're telling me you come back pregnant from a three-month stay and you're still a virgin? What? That's where Joseph's at right now. Remember, God always uses real people, real stories. We can't think of these things as fairy tales. We can't think of them as just the good guy wins. These are two normal people, Mary and Joseph, dealing with normal issues and real problems that God puts them right into. And that's what I want to jump into this morning. We'll look at uh, um, three things about Joseph. There's three actions in this text. And first is his doubt. Verse 18 after his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away. So Joseph, who's dealing with this stuff, is feeling all the normal emotions. Remember, he's a normal guy, not just a Bible character that's out and, you know, floating around in the air. He's a normal guy. So here he is dealing with all the normal emotions that me and you would feel. Maybe he's angry. Maybe he's hurt. Maybe he's heartbroken. This is the woman that he's betrothed to. He wants to spend the rest of his life with her. He's went to prepare a place for him. He wants to build a house for him. He wants to start a family with him. And she comes back pregnant. He's absolutely distraught and heartbroken. But the Bible says that Joseph is a just man or a righteous man. You ever wonder what kind of dude Joseph is? This is what kind of man he is right here. His woman comes back pregnant, not by him, with a baby bump. But he doesn't fly off the handle. He don't put his hands on her. He don't cuss her. He don't slander her family and, and everybody related to her or around her. He doesn't go get drunk with his buddies. The Bible says he's a just man. And so he's minded to put her away secretly and in private. Because they're betrothed, they would have had to went through a legal divorce. They would have had to went through all this stuff. And for Hebrews, Jews in this Hebrew culture, divorce was a huge deal. It was a big deal. And so you can imagine the embarrassment for both of them. But for Mary, this was grounds for stoning. Adultery was an even bigger deal to Jews. And so she could have been put to death for this. But because Joseph is the man that he is, he don't want to see her stoned. He don't want to see her name slandered. He don't want her known as an adulteress. So he decides the best thing he could do is do it as quiet and as private as possible where nobody knows why, nobody understands why. Which means even more because that means he is putting his own reputation on the line. Because he's not telling anything that's going on, he's keeping it private. Which means his young business of carpentry would be nothing. His reputation would be ruined. His young adult life would be absolutely over. That's what kind of man this is. He doesn't want to put Mary through all that. He doesn't want to see her stone. So he just steps back, 
thinks about what he does and stays calm about it all and decides to do this. And this is the application. Listen, this is the application. Whenever we read anything, even when it's like, wow, I don't understand the genealogy stuff, so-and-so, we got so-and-so, there's always an application for us. And this is what it is, men, women. It is so important to step back as Joseph did and think before we react in any situation. Joseph stepped back and he thought about what was going on. He put his mind to test. He thought about things. That is so important. I have so many people that come and ask me things and, and they seek advice on other things. And the best advice that I can give in any situation, take the time to step back, calm yourself and think about what you're doing before you do anything. Sometimes the house gets crazy. Holidays are coming up. We've got 45 places to be. We're trying to keep our marriages together. We're trying to keep our family together. We're trying to keep the kids from arguing all the time. Everybody's needing our ear. Everybody's Everybody's needing us to be a crutch on things. And sometimes the best thing to do is step back and think. Listen to God. Thinking, listening, and prayer go hand in hand. If it means going to the woods to get alone, go get in a tree stand and get alone with God. If it means turning the radio off on the radio off on the drive home, do it and get alone with God. Maybe the only free time you get's in the bathroom. Don't scroll Facebook. Don't watch YouTube. Think, listen, and pray and seek God's will. Seek and you shall find fine. Listen and you will receive what God has to say. He is so faithful to hear the prayers and the concerns of his people. He's promised to never leave us or forsake us. And Joseph steps back in what a perfect example for us. He steps back and he thinks, you want to make the wrong decision, brother? Then do it out of haste. You want to make the wrong statement or comment to your wife? Do it out of anger. Anything you do, don't do it out of haste. Don't do it out of a quick judgment. Don't do it out of emotion. If uh, Joseph had acted out of emotion, there's no telling what he would have done to Mary. There's no telling how the Christmas story would have wound up. But because he calmed himself, stepped back, stayed patient. You know, our world, so many times, you can see it in the news. I'm, I praise God that we live in a country where you are innocent until proven guilty. Because how many times in the news... Oh, the Rittenhouse trial was the perfect one. How many times in the news, or Jesse Smollett, how many times do you see everybody just jump on a bandwagon? You're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty. Thank God we live in a country that you're innocent until proven guilty. It's our human nature to just want to jump on it and go and act out of haste. But the best thing to do in every situation is step back, stay calm, and think and seek God's will and His direction. I learned a long time ago. Can I tell y'all a secret too? I learned from my dad in a bad way. Dad's taught me a lot of good things, but one of the things he doesn't do good is when he's, I mean, there's things that he, he does really good. Don't, he's probably watching, so I want to make sure that you understand I'm not saying this about everything. But dad is so impatient sometimes. And whenever you're building or doing something, dad is the type to just jump right in and gung-ho, go at it, go at it. And what I've learned, that's the worst thing you can do. Worst thing you can do because you'll make all kinds of mistakes. You'll make all kinds of problems that you got to go back through and do without any planning or thinking about it or getting something organized. You, it'll, it'll be all screwed up. It's like if you're, if you're building a house and you just take right off going at it. You don't put no measurements in it. You don't, you don't think about it. You don't plan nothing. You just go right in it. You got a board. I'm going to cut this board. And I'm going to start right here. It's going to be crooked. It ain't going to be square. It sure ain't going to be up to code. And the first time a windstorm comes through, it's going to blow it down. But if you step back with a sketch pad, make some notes, take some measurements, you begin to become an architect. And you can make a design of what you want. And when you do that, you can engineer these foreseeable problems out of the equation altogether. Problems that you would have had to dealt with. Problems that would have hit you right in the face if you just jumped into it. But when you step back and think... Pray about it. Seek God's will about it. There's things that you can engineer out of the equation altogether and avoid things that you would have had to hit straight on. And so it is in our lives. So it is in our families. So many times if we would just step back, think, trust God's will, trust his direction as men, as women, as spouses, as families, we must come together, seek God's will for our lives, seek God's will for our family and quit trusting our emotions. Trust God. Amen. Our emotions will lead us wrong every single time, but God will not fail us. Amen.
Amen. Next is Joseph has a dream. By the way, I want to say this. I hope Mary made Joseph a banana pudding every time he asked for one. Because he is such a great guy, isn't he? To go through what he went through, to have to deal with what he dealt with, and all the stuff that was going on in his head, he stayed so faithful. And he never <clears throat> left Mary. Never run out on her. <clears throat> Men, your wife needs you. Your family needs you. It's so important. Amen. In a society that is trying to do away with all these things, trying to do away with fatherhood, masculinity, all these other things. If you notice, God sent Gabriel to Joseph, and it was Joseph who called his name Jesus. We must step back and think. Verse 20, this is Joseph's dream. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Oh, come all you faithful, still got my throat scratched up. Saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you marry your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. I want to set Joseph aside just for a second. He's our key point. He's our subject. But I want to set him aside just for a second. And I think it's important to talk about this and hound this home. That Matthew, right out of the gate here in verse 18, clears up any doubt and speculation. And there would have been a lot about Jesus' humanness and his deity. There would have been a lot of speculation at this time because Mary conceived out of wedlock. And so a lot of people would have doubted, a lot of people would have called names, a lot of people would have kicked them to the dirt and said that Jesus was an illegitimate child of Mary's. But notice what Matthew does here. He kicks this right out of the, right out of the gate. He talks about this. And he says in verse 18, this is the birth, what is it, the, ver- the birth of the Son of God. This word for birth in the original Greek is the same in verse 1 used for genealogy. In verse 1, Matthew gives us this long list that goes back all through Joseph's grandkids and other things and you know, all the way back to David. And it's proving Jesus Christ is fully human. But what separates us from all the other cults, all the other religions, all the other stuff is that we believe that Jesus was fully human because Matthew gives us this physical bloodline, but also that he is fully God, Amen. fully deity. In verse Verse 18, what, what Matthew's starting with is this is the birth, the son of, son of God, Jesus Christ. This is it right here. He's saying that if Jesus wasn't born of a virgin, then everything that we've built our faith on, everything that we've built our faith on is right in this dream that, that Gabriel is talking to Joseph in. Everything we've built our faith on is right here. And if Jesus wasn't born of a virgin, if it wasn't a miracle birth from heaven, then everything that we believe is wrong. Everything. That means there is no salvation. There were no miracles. There were no teachings, no healings. There was no cross or resurrection. There is no heaven. That's what that means. That's why it's so important to believe the virgin birth. That's why it's so important for us to to stand firm on that. And you're looking at me like, duh. And I would have thought the same thing. But one of the things that blew my mind, I found something, and you can find it on the Internet for yourself. There was a poll taken in the late 90s. And I would say if I polled this room and said, do you believe that Jesus Christ was truly born of a virgin? I'm confident in saying that most, if not all, would say, I believe that. And you must to be a Christian. Amen. But there was a poll taken in the late 90s that took all the different Christian denominations in America. And they did mainly the, the, the bigger ones, the the main ones that everybody knows and thinks about, the ones that have the highest density and inside their, their walls. And they asked their clergy, their leaders, their deacons, the preachers, the, the, all the leaderships of these different denominations and churches, they polled them with this question. Do you believe that Jesus Christ was truly born of a virgin? Can I read you these numbers? And you can find it for yourself. I'm not making this up. 79% of Lutherans believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. of Baptists believe that Jesus was truly born of a virgin. 
56% of Episcopalians truly believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. 51%, 1% more than half, Presbyterians believe that He was truly born of a virgin. 40% of Methodists believe that He was truly born of a virgin. I would have never in my life guessed that. These are leaders. This isn't just, nor- I mean, these are preachers, these are pastors, these are clergy members, elders, deacons. And if they don't believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, the very thing we found our faith on, if they don't believe that He was truly born of a virgin, how in the world could the lost world believe it? It is so important, friends. The enemy has been trying for so long to dispute it. You know, men have been trying to prove it false and do all these other things. And you know, if I was the enemy, the reason this comes about is these these liberal theologians out there now say, well, Matthew, this book was written between A.D. 40 and A.D. 70. There's this 30-year window, and nobody knows the exact year. They just know it's this window of 30 years. And they say in this 30 years when he wrote this book, there was a lot of myths and legends floating around about virgin. And, births. and so Matthew probably just grabbed one out of the sky somewhere and inserted it into his book. Are you kidding me? How do you even get the name theologian? It is so important because the enemy works so hard to defy Christ. He works so hard to defy the church. Men have worked so hard to dispute it. And it's so important that we stand on what we know to be right. And that's that God is fully human. Jesus Christ is fully human and fully God. Born of a virgin. Came and fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies. Lived a sinless life and died for sinners like you and me so that we may go to heaven. Amen. And if you believe that, say amen. It's so important. How could we not teach this? How could we not believe this? How could we not stand on it? So many people run around looking for these other things and looking for signs and looking for wonders and looking for more evidence. God has given us everything we need right here. And so Matthew in verse 18 nips it in the bud, takes it on head first and says, Jesus was born of a virgin. To prove that it was a miracle birth. To prove that He is fully human, but also full deity. Amen? Amen. All right, back to Joseph. Notice this. When he was thinking, when he had stepped away to think, God sent him a dream and used Gabriel in this dream. God honored his calmness. God honored his sincerity in the fact that he was willing to go think about things. That he was willing to step away before he made any decisions and think about what he was doing. God honored that. And so God sent him a dream to clear up any doubt. And the relief that your heartbroken, the woman you love is pregnant by, you don't even know what. And Gabriel says, you don't have to worry. Mary's a virgin. And not only that, think about the weight of this, fathers. Think about this. These are real people. She's pregnant with the Son of God. And Joseph, he's going to be raised in your house. Think about the relief that you know that Mary is is your wife. You can go forward and and call that water under the bridge. But immediately the weight, oh my goodness. Now all of a sudden you go from this young person, this innocent person who's just trying to start life to now Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is going to be raised in your house. You and Mary are going to be earthly guardians to the Son of God. Which brings us to his next, verse 24, his determination. Then Joseph being roused from sleep did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took him his wife. And did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So the weight that Joseph's carrying, all the emotions that he's went through. Think about this little two, three day span that he's went through and everything that's went on in his head. He goes from one thing to another thing just like that at the flip of a hat. And he's trying to deal with everything and then the weight. And it immediately made me think about the first time that I held Wyatt. You know, a, mother, a mother's care is different than a father's care. And a mother immediately goes to, to taking care of the baby, making sure the baby's taken care of and fed and comforted, making sure the baby uh, feels comfortable in mother's arms, making sure the baby stays warm. But when I held Wyatt and Austin both for the first time, that fatherly instinct, that God-given fatherly instinct kicked in. And I didn't think about baby Wyatt and baby Austin anymore. 
I immediately started thinking about their future. As a father, how can I protect them? As a father, how can I prepare them for life? As a father, how can I make sure that they they know how to be strong? As a father, how can I make sure that they know how to overcome fear? A father's instinct and a father's love is different than a mother's. That's why it's so important that the two be together and stay together. Because the kid needs both. God does this beautiful thing in giving two separate people that come together to take care of children. That's That's what God called Mary and Joseph to do. And it's so important that we men give our children, make them a priority. Make them such a, not a secondhand thought. When I was little, I remember all I wanted to do was throw baseball with my dad. And I would wait when he got home and I had my glove ready and his glove ready. And I just wanted to throw baseball with him. And you know, they bought me one of those nets where you throw it and it comes back to you. But it wasn't the same. I wanted to throw with dad. And now, 25 years later, Wyatt, when I come down the road, he's got my baseball glove and his ready. All he wants to do is throw with dad. And I used to get frustrated. I got things I got to do. I got things I got to take care of around the house. I got all this other stuff. Just got in from work. So you know how that is. You're still hyped up. You need a minute to kind of, you know, calm down. And you got all this other stuff. And then the Lord was like, Ben, you know, all that might go away one day. He might quit asking. He might quit caring. He might not even want to be around so much. And I had this cats in the cradle thing going on in my head, you know. The most important thing we can do for our families, for our kids, is make sure they're a priority in our life. Maybe God chose Joseph because of the attributes that he showed, because of his self-control, because of his calmness, because of his patience. It would have gave Jesus the perfect environment to grow up in. Maybe that's why God chose him, because he showed how much he loved his family, how much he would take care of his family, how out of the way he was willing to go for his family. Maybe that's why God chose Joseph. So why did God choose you? Why did God choose me? To be the fathers and mothers and spouses for our kids, for our families. Why did he choose us? We can't act out of all this crazy emotion and other things and fear. We must get alone with God and trust Him. That's why it's so important. I hate hearing people talk about how you don't need the Bible and you don't need prayer to be a Christian. Sure, but you'll be a terrible Christian because that's how God talks to us. Get alone with Him. Seek Him. Seek His direction. Seek His will for our lives. Oh my gosh, the decisions that we constantly have to make as families, as grown-ups, as adults. We're all the time faced with these decisions. Do I go right? Do I go left? Where do I go? If we don't seek God, how would we make the right decision? We wouldn't. We'd be doing circles all the time, just like the people, uh, the Israelite people back in Moses' day. Remember, they did circles for generations because they refused to seek God's will. It's so important as us men to seek God's will for our family. Women, to seek God's will for your children, for your family. It's so important. We have in our our modern day, uh, can I talk to you all for a minute? If Mary and Joseph, think about this, if Mary and Joseph had been like a lot of young adults nowadays, it had been rough for Jesus to grow up into. Mary and Joseph was so special, like what Whitney said to the kids. God didn't just select two random people. God selected two people that were faithful to him, that put their trust completely into him. Because if God had just chosen two random people, who knows what would have happened. But God chose two people who threw it all. When nothing made sense, when everything was confusing, when everything was going around, they refused to turn their back on God. They trusted him wholeheartedly. That's what we're called to do, to trust him wholeheartedly with our family, with our children, just as Mary and Joseph did. Fathers, it is so important to look at Joseph and say, this is what I have to be. This is the man that I have to be. Joseph knew his role. One of the things I want to highlight here that gets lost in the Christmas narrative. Joseph knew God's will. Joseph knew the prophecy that Jesus had to be born of a virgin, not just conceived, born of a virgin. When the angel of the Lord appeared to him, Gabriel, he got up, no more hesitation, and married Mary and took her. And the Bible said that he did not know her 
physically, intimately. He did not know his wife until after Jesus was born. That's the determination. That's the loyalty that Joseph showed here. He took his wife and knew God's prophecy and kept it. Kept it. And did not know Mary until after Jesus was born. This is a man that knew his role. He knew how important it was that he be there for Mary, that he be there for Jesus, that he be there for the man that he was called to be. He knew how important it was to protect his family. And we see that when he took Mary and Jesus and escaped Herod and his maniac law and they went to Egypt. He knew how important it was to train up his children in the way they should go. And we see that when he was continuously taking his family to Jerusalem and they were going to the temple to worship. Remember, Jesus got left with the scribes and Pharisees learning when he was 12. Joseph knew how important it was to love his wife. And we see that in the text itself. That's why it's so important for us with our children how to teach them these things, how to teach them how to talk to their spouses. There's nothing nastier than seeing two people, a man and woman, constantly going at it, and then the kids constantly hear that, and they grow up talking to their mama like they're a piece of dirt. It's our jobs to make sure that our kids grow up and know how to love your spouse, how to take care of your family, how to talk to your spouse, how to treat your spouse. That way when they grow up, they can have these same skills and knowledge. That way when they grow up, it's not a generation of people who don't know how to say thank you and yes sir, no sir. Which is kind of where we're at now. It's so important to seek God's will on everything. For our family's sake, for our children's sake, we must be Joseph, we must be Mary, and we must give God everything we have. Not just our soul, we must give Him our life, we must give Him our house, we must give Him our marriage, and trust His direction. Amen? Amen. 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 Dear Heavenly Father, if you would stand with us this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the blessing of Christmas. Thank you so much for loving us enough to send Jesus Christ, who all things were created through, who had a hand in creation, made himself human to be born of a virgin who was faithful to you. Lord, thank you for Joseph, for showing us how to, how to be men and how to take care of our families. Thank you for Mary for showing us what faith is. And Lord, as we go our way, we just want to say thank you. Please guide us, direct us as we go our way through the week. Please use us, Lord. In your holy name we pray. Amen.